When Haley and I bought the old Victorian house on Maple Street, we felt like we'd stumbled upon a hidden gem. The house had character, large bay windows, ornate woodwork, and a sweeping staircase that creaked with history. It was everything we wanted, despite needing some renovation. Our cat, Shadow, a sleek black feline with piercing green eyes, took to the house immediately. He darted around the place as if he had discovered his own kingdom, but that changed after our first big renovation project. We were tearing down a wall to create a more open living space when I noticed something odd. Behind a section of drywall under the staircase, there was a hollow sound. Haley, come check this out. What is it? I think there's something behind this wall. A few more swings with the sledgehammer revealed a small door, hidden and forgotten. Haley and I exchanged excited glances and pulled it open. The air that escaped was stale, carrying with it the scent of damp wood and something else. Something metallic. Wow, it's a storage room. Inside, the room was cramped, barely large enough for an adult to stand up straight. Dust-covered shelves lined the walls, filled with old, forgotten trinkets. But what caught my eye was in the center of the room. Handcuffs chained to the floor. An icy chill ran down my spine as I stared at them. What the hell? Why would anyone need handcuffs down here? We left the room quickly, deciding to clean it out another day. But Shadow had other ideas. He began acting strangely around the area, hissing and arching his back whenever he got too close to the hidden door. That night, strange noises echoed through the halls. Soft whispers, like distant conversations, would drift through the rooms, sending shivers down my spine. As I lay in bed, I heard a faint tapping. I got up, following the sound down the staircase. The hidden door was open. My heart pounded in my chest. I vividly remembered closing it. I felt a sudden, inexplicable urge to close it and run, but I didn't. I stepped inside. The air was suddenly freezing as soon as I stepped inside. The hair on my arms stood on end. And then, the handcuffs rattled slightly, as if tugged by an invisible force. I bolted out of the room and slammed the door shut. The next day, I decided to set up a camera facing the hidden door. Haley thought I was overreacting, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. Just humor me, please. I need to know if there's something... something there. All right. If it'll help you sleep. I watched the footage religiously, but for the first few nights there was nothing unusual. Shadow continued his erratic behavior, walking up to that room and setting guard outside. Ever so often, he would make hissing sounds. Then, on the fifth night, the footage changed. The camera picked up Shadow pacing nervously in front of the hidden door. He meowed frantically, and then the door creaked open by itself. My breath caught in my throat as I watched a hand, a pale, skeletal hand, appear from thin air, clutching the handcuffs and yanking them violently. The chains rattled, and the hand vanished as quickly as it had appeared. Oh my god! Haley, you you need to see this. I showed her the footage. Her face went pale as well. I had no answers, only a growing sense of dread. The house no longer felt like a home, but a prison of shadows and secrets. I knew we had to uncover the truth behind the hidden room before it consumed us entirely. I was not ready to move again since I had already sunk a lot of money into this place. Haley went around the neighborhood and spoke to people about the house's history. When that didn't give results, she spent hours at the local library, poring over old records. That is when she got answers from the old librarian. Do you remember anyone talking about strange occurrences at the old Victorian on Maple Street? Oh, that house has a bit of a dark past. It was owned by a man named Jacob Thorne in the late 1800s. Rumor has it he wasn't quite right in the head. What do you mean? They say he was a recluse, obsessed with occult practices. Some even whispered that he kept people imprisoned in his house. Slaves. But that's just a local legend, of course. 
the pieces began to fit together, but they painted a grim picture. Jacob Thorne, the occult practices, the hidden room with handcuffs, it all pointed to something sinister. Despite our fear, we decided to get rid of the handcuffs. Armed with a flashlight and a crowbar, I pried open the door. The air inside was even colder than before, the metallic scent stronger. Haley stayed back, her face pale with fear. Shadow hissed from outside. I stepped inside, my heart pounding in my chest. The handcuffs lay on the floor, untouched but ominous. As I reached out to touch them, a sudden force yanked them from my grasp, sending me sprawling. Haley, get out of here! But before she could react, the door slammed shut. Darkness enveloped me, the temperature dropping rapidly. Whispers filled the air, growing louder and more frantic. I fumbled for my flashlight, the beam flickering as if struggling against the malevolent presence. Who's there? Get out! This is my house now! You don't belong here! That is when I saw it in the low light emanating from the flashlight. A figure emerged from the thin air. A black man with a translucent body, eyes pale as ivory, and his hand tied to the handcuff. It was faint at first, but grew more solid, clearly visible to my eyes in some time. It didn't seem to sense me, but I could gather that the spirit was in pain. It growled slowly in an otherworldly noise, which got heavier and louder. Soon, the space around me began vibrating, shaking violently. Haley banged on the closed door from outside and yelled my name. I was paralyzed, but I knew that what I was about to do was right. With determination, I grabbed the crowbar and swung it at the handcuffs. They resisted at first, as if protected by some unseen force. With each strike, the cries of the black man's spirit grew louder, more frantic. I soon realized that I couldn't break the chains like that. So, instead, I started hitting the old times around it. They started developing cracks, and with a few more strikes, the tiles broke, releasing the chain. The moment they broke, a deafening scream filled the house. The figure suddenly stood still, no noise, no movement, as if looking at me with his pale eyes. And then he let out a dying wail before dissolving into a mist, the cold air dissipating. The door swung open and Haley ran in to hug me. The chains dissolved into the air as well. The oppressive atmosphere lifted, replaced by a serene silence. Shadow appeared, rubbing against our legs, his behavior back to normal, and he started licking my leg. It's over. We did it. The poor soul. Thank God it's finally free. We agreed to fill in the storage space forever, knowing that some secrets are better left buried. As we settled into our now peaceful home, we felt a sense of closure. The house on Maple Street still had its history, but we had put one of its darkest chapters to rest. When Alice and I moved into the quaint little house on Cedar Street, we thought we had found our perfect home. The neighborhood was quiet, the kind of place where you could imagine raising kids and living peacefully. Boy, were we wrong. The first night, we heard them. Soft whispers drifting through the house, the kind you can almost convince yourself are just the wind. We fell into an uneasy sleep, hoping it was just new house jitters. But the next morning, we discovered something odd. The kitchen was a mess, cabinets open, food scattered across the counters, and half-eaten apples left on the floor. Did you come down last night? No, I thought you did. We were both unnerved, but tried to laugh it off. We cleaned up, chalking it up to some animal that might have snuck in. That night, we made sure everything was locked up tight, but the whispers returned, more insistent this time. The next morning was worse. Not only was the kitchen raided again, but there were muddy footprints of human feet leading off from the pantry. I decided it was time to set up a camera. If something or someone was sneaking into our house, we needed to know. The following morning, the kitchen was raided again. I checked the footage with trembling hands. What I saw made my blood run cold. 
Around 3 a.m., the pantry door creaked open, and a gaunt, disheveled man emerged. His eyes were wild, and his clothes were filthy. He moved around the kitchen, rummaging through our food with desperate, jerky movements. Alice's face turned ashen as she watched the footage. Who is he? How did he get in? We called the police, but they found nothing. No sign of forced entry, no clues to the man's identity. The officers suggested it might be a homeless person who somehow found a way into the house, but we knew it was more than that. We re-watched the footage that night, focusing on the pantry. There, almost hidden behind the shelves, was a small door that we had never noticed before. It led to a hidden storage path beneath the house. With a flashlight in hand, I ventured into the cramped, dark space. The air was thick and musty, and as I crawled through, I found an opening, an entrance to a tunnel dug into the earth. We were horrified. The idea that someone had been living beneath our house, sneaking in at night, was almost too much to bear. That is when I heard movements, and suddenly, this skinny, weird-looking ghost of a man jumped before my flashlight. I screamed and ran up. He gave chase. As soon as I got back up to the kitchen and yelled at Alice to shut the door, he lunged at us with a feral scream. The man was stronger than he looked, driven by a madness we couldn't understand. He clawed at us, his nails digging into our skin. Alice screamed as he knocked her to the floor. Meanwhile, I grabbed a baseball bat and swung it with all my strength, connecting with his shoulder. Alice, get out! Call the police! But she didn't leave. She grabbed a knife from the counter and slashed at the man, giving us a moment to gain the upper hand. We managed to wrestle him to the ground, but not before he bit into my arm. I screamed in pain. Ah, hold him down! The man, fueled by a wild desperation, twisted free from our grip and lashed out with strength. He swung a fist at Alice, catching her on the cheek and sending her sprawling. I lunged at him with the bat, but he ducked this time and slammed into me, knocking me to the floor. She scrambled to her feet, brandishing the knife with trembling hands. The man eyed us both, his lips curling into a sinister grin. He jumped at me again, his fingers clawing at my face. I swung the bat, but he caught it and wrenched it from my hands, tossing it across the room. The psycho's eyes were wild, darting between us. He feigned towards Alice, then pivoted and tackled me to the ground. His hands wrapped around my throat, squeezing with terrifying force. I gasped for air, my vision blurring as I struggled beneath him. Larry, hang on! Alice lunged forward, slashing at the man's arm. He howled in pain and released his grip on my throat, turning his fury towards her. He backhanded her across the face, the force of the blow sending her crashing into the cabinets. I tried to get up, but he kicked me hard in the ribs, the pain exploding through my side. He turned his attention back to Alice, who was struggling to get up. He grabbed her by the hair, lifting her off the ground and slamming her into the counter. Desperation gave me strength. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the pain, and grabbed a heavy skillet from the stove. I swung it at the psycho, catching him on the back of the head. He staggered, releasing Alice, and turned towards me with a murderous glare. He charged at me, but Alice, her face bloody and eyes blazing with determination, tackled him from the side. The three of us went down in a heap, struggling and thrashing. He clawed at Alice, tearing at her clothes and skin, but she held on, fighting with everything she had. I managed to grab the bat again and brought it down on his leg. He screamed in pain, his grip on Alice weakening. She slashed at him again with the knife, and he rolled off her, clutching his bleeding leg. Now, Larry! We moved together, grabbing his arms and forcing him onto his stomach. He struggled, kicking and thrashing, but we held on, pinning his arms behind his back. I grabbed the belt from my pants and looped it around his wrists, pulling it tight. He let out a feral growl, bucking and writhing beneath us, but the fight was leaving him. Blood oozed from the cuts on his arms and leg, and his movements grew weaker. Finally, he lay still. 
his chest heaving with ragged breaths. I grabbed the bat and slammed at his head for one last time, knocking him out immediately. We slumped to the floor, exhausted and battered. The psycho lay between us. The adrenaline began to wear off, and the pain of our injury set in. Alice's face was swollen and bruised, blood trickling from a cut on her lip. My arm throbbed where he had bitten me, and my ribs ached with every breath. Are you okay? She nodded her head before passing on the phone to me. The sound of sirens filled the air, and moments later the police burst into the house. They took the man into custody, his eyes still filled with the same wild rage as they dragged him away. Paramedics treated our injuries, and we gave our statements, recounting the nightmare we had just survived. The police found later that the man was using the hidden storage area as his drug den. He had dug a tunnel to it and used the hidden door in the kitchen to raid for food. As the police cars disappeared down the street, the reality of what had happened began to sink in. We had fought for our lives and won, but the scars, both physical and emotional, would remain. I pulled Alice toward me, and we hugged, clinging on to each other as tears escaped our eyes.